gentlemen, welcome to Jerusalem Studio. When U.S. President Donald Trump unveiled his long-awaited vision for peace between Israelis and Palestinians last week, it drew, as expected, both praise and criticism. While Trump was given credit for trying to succeed where his predecessors failed, he was also faulted for various details of his so-called deal of the century. To analyze the American initiative and its implications, we're joined here in the studio by Mr. Dan Dyker, who is a senior fellow and the director of the Project on Political Warfare at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Thank Oren, you. and Dr. Fadi Ismail, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC in Herzliya. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding on uh, this so-called deal of the century, and how is Israel currently reacting to this uh, uh, plan, if you will? So it's a 181-page document. Uh, most people, uh, if at all, have bothered to read it online. I saw the uh, printed uh, version on your desk. I know you've uh, studied it. And um, I mention it because there is a difference between the public presentation uh, a week ago or so, a week and a half ago, and the uh, fine print when you go over the document. The um, uh, criticism uh, lobbed at uh, uh, President Trump and Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who stood next to him um, at the ceremony, had to do with both content and context. Um, as for the content, um, the uh, vision, because uh, this is what uh, President Trump calls it, his vision for peace to prosperity has two parts, the political framework and then the financial business uh, development uh, phase. Now, the uh, political uh, uh, part of it has to do with Israel agreeing to a Palestinian state which has never been uh, formally the case with Israel. Various Israeli prime ministers, Sharon, Olmert, and then Netanyahu himself 10 years ago, have alluded to it. But this has never been official Israeli policy. In return for that, Israel is to have sovereignty over all of its settlements in the West Bank. Uh, some of it are only isolated enclaves. Some, most of the settlements are in blocks adjacent to the Israeli border. It would be relatively easy to annex these territories. And also the Jordan Valley, which is approximately 30% of the territory of the West Bank. The uh, sequence um, is such that the Palestinians, if they fulfill all the criteria dictated to them, will get what is promised them only four years from now. Why is that a problem? Among other things, because Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, will be very old and very ill if he survives uh, to that time. Mr. Dyker, to what degree is this deal actually a initiative directed as a dialogue between the, the Trump administration and the Arab world vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and the various dimensions of that issue? Or is it more of a, uh, this is the reality on the ground, just accept what it is, we'll pay you a lot of money and just deal with it? Jonathan, I think you, you raise a key question here. And this has been a largely overlooked strategic context for this uh, uh, for this vision, the U.S. vision, is that uh, the Saudis, the Gulf states, the um, the, the, the Omanis and, uh, uh, and the Bahrainis have been deeply involved in this, what's called a ground-up peace approach, a, an, an opposite approach to peace that has been taken as, as my colleague Amir Orden has, has talked about over the last 25 years since the beginning of the Oslo process. The, the Arab world today, the Arab Sunni establishment, it is little known in the mainstream media, 
has distanced itself from the Palestinians privately and are very upset with the Palestinian leadership because they view the Palestinians as being an obstacle to a more united um, Sunni Arab and Israeli approach to countering the Iranian regime's race for regional hegemony and, in, and destabilizing the Middle East. So this is very much, as you suggest in your question, there is very much a regional context to this um, uh, particular vision or this particular blueprint uh, for deal that's extremely important to, to, uh, uh, to take into account, just to mention that for the first time ever in six different peace processes uh, and blueprints since 2000, for the first time, the ambassadors of Oman, Bahrain, and the Gulf states were in the room, in the East Room of the White House, uh, during the, the release of the plan. That's an extremely important point. Second point is that the Saudis, the king called Mahmoud Abbas and said, start negotiating with, with, with the Israelis. Final, the, the final point here is, I think, perhaps we'll continue this. There's a whole strategic context, as Mr. Oren talked about in the Jordan Valley, that we haven't seen since the Robin days, and that is the restoration of what's called security first um, peacemaking for the Israelis. But we'll go into that as we move forward. Dr. Ismail, your perception on this? I, that was a very, very good uh, summary. I wanted to say something about the approach about the style of approach of uh, Mr. Kushner here. I think he approached this whole thing uh, the way an engineer approaches an engineering problem. And he is, uh, his entire style of thinking as it comes through those 181 pages, and I wonder why it's 181, maybe it, has, maybe it alludes to that famous resolution. Um, <laughs> it's, like, um, it's like he's always looking for workarounds and he looks for fixes to all kinds of situations on the ground that, by the way, were created originally to make it impossible, to deliberately to make it impossible to, to partition the country. Um, and, uh, and that's his approach, who's using that almost like a developer's approach. And, he, uh, and when you listen to his uh, conversation, he uses that language. It's a very business school-oriented type of language. Uh, that is a very typical approach of a very young politician. And this is the kind of thing, if I, if I had students now in college that I would have, I would give them an exercise he would, and he would write this as an exercise, he would get an A minus for it, because it's really, really good. Life is about politics, not about solutions. Very yeah. good, but not good enough with uh, the it's minus a, being the there? The question is what the, what people, I mean, in the end it's people. Right. And it could be, I'm not, it means the plan could be brilliant. You know what, even genius to some points. All these ideas about uh, tunnels and uh, <clears throat> this and that, uh, the, the Western Negev area, the, the, that was like a, a, a stroke of genius, and it wasn't Kushner's stroke. I mean, he basically took plans for the past and created some kind of a hybrid from all of them. He really tries to find a solution that is tailored to the situation on the ground, and as I said, an engineer. Uh, politics are different. Politics are always different. Mr. Ogan, I, I'd like to get uh, the Arab reaction to the situation. Uh, we hear the, the uh, Organization for Islamic Cooperation uh, rejecting this wholeheartedly, but at the same meeting, the chairman of the uh, that same uh, summit that was uh, taking place in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia uh, was the foreign uh, minister of uh, the the kingdom, who who said again, "We're going to work hard to keep these negotiations alive between the Israelis and the Palestinians." To further the Palestinian cause were his last words to it, but at the same time, there is a lot of cautious uh, wording to each statement uh, brought out. Also by Egypt, you hear uh, uh, very strong words uh, towards the Palestinian Authority calling on them to study the deal and not reject it outright. But at the same time, uh, at the Arab League uh, meeting that was held in Cairo, we hear the Foreign Minister Samih Shukri saying, OK, we, we need to uh, really look more on the Palestinian approach of things, alluding to the fact that the Arabs are well aware that this deal is uh, more of an Israeli favorable deal than a Palestinian one, but at the same time, also understanding the, the significant added value that it would give the regional aspect of this uh, agreement, uh, $50 billion in uh, cash to a lot of projects that would save the economy in Egypt, the, the economy of uh, Jordan, the economy of, uh, of Lebanon, of many of those countries in the region that are failing as states right now because of those economic hardships? So there are two aspects to your question. The second one is uh, President Trump's inclination to use money uh, either as an incentive or as punishment, as a fine. 
you either get a bonus if you do something, or you are going to pay at least uh, by withholding funds uh, from you. And uh, this is very simplistic, especially since in the Middle East uh, there are uh, quality values, not quantity-based ones like uh, dignity, respect. Uh, people have uh, to feel that uh, their uh, interests have been taken care of, um, face saving, all of these. Uh, it doesn't seem as if the authors of this document came from uh, the school which understands Arabia, uh, perhaps not even uh, Israelis, but this is something else. The other aspect uh, speaks to what both Dan and Fadi uh, alluded to, and that is uh, the uh, relationship between the Arab world and the Palestinians. Now, most of the Arab leaders and most of the Arab states um, are only paying lip service, but they do have to pay it. And for them, whatever is good for the Palestinians is good for them. They are not going to be more Muslim than the Ayatollah. If the Palestinians say uh, partitioning the West Bank is good for us, fine, do it. Jerusalem is another matter, but in most of the issues, fine. However, in order to get that, you must have the Palestinian street, quote unquote, which is the center of gravity, not the Palestinian leadership, support such a, a solution. And in order to get that, and most governments, the Israeli government, the American government, others, always poll. They, they conduct public opinion polls in the Palestinian electorate through Palestinian pollsters. They should have known that the reception that President Abbas will get from his electorate will not be very positive. And they had to, as they say in the army, prepare the battlefield. They had to have secret talks. They didn't have, except for an intelligent channel between the CIA and Majdi Farage, the head of the security forces in the, in the West Bank, they didn't have a channel in order to soften the Nevertheless, blow. those uh, discussions were deep and, and extensive. But they had to do with security cooperation mostly. They did not soften uh, Abu Mazen's, Mahmoud Abbas's, opposition uh, to the deal. And this uh, is because following the relocation of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, Abbas uh, cut off all contacts with President Trump. So it was a unilateral proposition, the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and therefore the, the um, uh, Arab states did not get enough political cover, and as Fadi mentioned earlier, it's politics. You go into a conference wishing for some result, including what you said the Saudi foreign minister uh, spoke to and, and other stuff, and at the end, because you want to reach a consensus and some parties are more convincing than others or are putting more pressure, the moderates gave in, and what we had was a consensus extremist position. Mr. Dyker, to what degree, uh, we know that for years the Palestinians were seen as, as the problem of the Middle East uh, uh, by the Middle Eastern countries themselves, if it's Lebanon, uh, a vast uh, uh, Palestinian population that uh, uh, infringed the dynamic, the political dynamic of that country, same in Syria, same in Jordan, where more than 77% of uh, all of Jordan is Palestinian proper, of course, excluding the, the refugees that uh, lately came there from uh, uh, Syria and other countries in the region. There is uh, a mounting number of so-called refugees that are not really uh, first-generation refugees of the 1948 war, but have been uh, the children, grandchildren, and so on. To what degree do you see this uh, uh, deal now being seen more of a solution, that the Palestinians would be integrated into the various societies at hand and will in change or in turn receive bailout money in order to get out of their overwhelming uh, economic issues? Well, Jonathan, you, you've asked a few very good questions in an, in an overall context. I think we have to. I think we have to assign. First of all, I, I want to uh, make this comment: the, the Palestinian Authority leadership must 
um, take more responsibility in the context of this discussion. Let's let's remember, they refused offers for sovereignty in 2000, 2001 at Taba, um, 2003, uh, the roadmap to peace, 2005 in a coordinated um, unilateral pullout from Gaza, even though it was it was unilateral, but it was coordinated with the Palestinian Authority. In 2008, the Annapolis Conference, 2014, they refused the Kerry deal, and they told Kerry, and this is a quote, do not come back to Ramallah. So, they, they, you know, they were offered 94%, 96%. So this is a 70% deal. So on the face of it, you can understand why they would refuse this, because they, they got much less. As Brett Stevens wrote in the New York Times today, every time the Palestinians since 1947 have said no, they've gotten less and less and less and less. So that would militate towards the idea or suggest the idea that, that they should not immediately say no. They could say yes, but. And um, as Fadi mentioned, politics, you know, there's this notion of yes, but, and then begin to negotiate directly uh, with Israel. The, the Palestinians are losing uh, sympathy, uh, I think, if they were to completely re refuse this deal. Also, we see very clear signifiers from the Arab world towards the Palestinians. The fact that the Arab world, as opposed to decades ago, they would have said, you know, like the three no's at Khartoum in 1967, no to, uh, no to peace, no to recognition, no to negotiations. Today, they said yes to all three. It's really the, it's the three yeses of the, of the Saudi-led Arab world. So I think the Palestinians really need to understand that they are not perceived, understood to be the central problem in the Middle East anymore. N nonetheless, it is definitely a political conflict that, that, that must be solved. And this is the only model that began with um, former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. This is fairly close to the Rabin vision from 1995, uh, even though he did not he, he opposed sovereignty for the Palestinians, but it's a vision, if you look at the map, and you look at the maps then, that were fairly similar, 70% for Israel today um, and 70% for Israel back in 1995, and I think we should pay attention to that context. Dr. Ismail, when we're talking about uh, the Palestinian rejection, are the Palestinians, and this is something that I've been hearing for quite some time now in, in Ramallah and elsewhere, mm -hmm. are the Palestinians unwilling or even uninterested to uh, bring about a two-state solution, considering the fact that the, the idea of a one-state solution is becoming more and more popular in the streets of uh, the Palestinian uh, territories within the context of Israel, not necessarily outside of there. But to what degree are they continuing to reject? Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Jared Kushner said on several occasions, uh, quoting uh, Abba Evan, the former uh, Israeli uh, diplomat, uh, the Palestinians never seize an opportunity to seize an opportunity. To it's what an degree? They never miss an opportunity. They never miss an opportunity. Miss, yes, exactly. Um, you know, <coughs> I, I don't think I can read other people's minds, but uh, I'll tell you what, I, I did talk to people and, and on the here and there, I hear about opinions from the from the Ramallah Street, from the Jenin Street, from the. They are not very impressed with the idea of a one state. I'll tell you the truth. I mean, there's this uh, thing that's going on around in Israeli uh, media and so on, saying that. But when you talk to them, actually, they all oh no, we don't want. We just want our own. Well, I spoke with some so, of them directly. Some are very senior leaders that say one thing to the media where they support a two-state solution that's and that's true. the official line. But behind closed doors, they will say, no, we want one state solution because ultimately our children will grow and we will have more and more. Uh, true. It, we will win saying. the battle of demographics. That's what I'm saying. There, There is a, well, it's like you go to the Israeli Palestinians, the Israeli Arabs, and all of their events, even the weddings, they carry Palestinian flags. But tell them, okay, join the Palestinian state, same religion, same language, same politics. They go insane. To them, it's uh, it's uh, ethnic cleansing. And mm. you go, wait a minute, but you just a second ago said, you know, the funny thing, that two, a couple of days ago, there was a demonstration in Belk al Garbiya, and they were um, opposing this plan while carrying Palestinian flags, but the plan joins you with the Palestine. I mean, there's something... Yeah, there is a certain element of confusion. I think if I hear anything in the street, there is a lot of confusion. They have a whole long history of distrust. They have been, if I say, we use a little bit of a street language, they have been screwed over so many times by their own leaders, by superpowers, by, by every situation, all this. They just don't believe anything. So if you talk to them rationally, one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, they're, they're, they will be very, very easy. Once it comes to committing yourself to a political standpoint publicly, 
all of his fears, all of, some of all fears comes in, and again, somebody is messing with us in some way. We have to get over that psychological barrier. And it doesn't necessarily have something to do with it. Well, maybe it does have something to do with Israel, but it's not really has something to do with this specific plan. Or the, because this plan, yeah, takes pieces of land, but it also gives back pieces of land. So when you look at the, at the balance, I'm not sure that in terms of numbers, I'm not sure they are losing that much, you know? If there is one big loss, is East Jerusalem. That, that's a big one, and I don't see it passing by anyone. Eastern Jerusalem is definitely not Jerusalem. Uh, no, no, yeah, and, and uh, there's no way that anybody in the two billion Muslims in the world will accept the idea that they have absolutely no foot in inside the walls. That's not just, we can just drop it now. It's not right. gonna happen. But okay, even Mr. Shokushnam said it himself, said, hey, it is a conceptual map. If you have a few points we can talk about, please bring them in. Now, it is also true, one thing, uh, another thing I've learned in politics, when you say no, you need to know how to say no. There are very, very sophisticated ways of saying no. Like uh, and like the Zionist movement was brilliant in saying no while saying yes, or saying yes while saying no. I mean, this is cool. They said yes to the Peel Agreement. They said yes to the 1947 Agreement. They said yes to a whole slew of things that the intent was actually a big no because it wasn't good enough. And I think that the yes today is also a sort of a no, but it's a very sophisticated no. There is no way that Smotrich and those guys will accept a Palestinian state, a Palestinian capital city in Abu Dhabi. A, uh, well, they say it openly also yeah, that so they won't accept it. it. So basically it's a the, yes. The right-wing uh, partners of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Mr. Olin, I, I'd like to hear your response to this, but I also want to hear about uh, the the wording used in the deal of the century also pertaining to the Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, it, when I read it uh, at first, it said, you know, wholeheartedly maintaining the status quo is going to happen, but, and this is a, a, a big uh, shift in, in the so-called status quo, Prayer for all religions will need to be accepted by Jordan, something that the Muslims will not agree to, of course, because currently the situation on the Temple Mount is only Muslims are allowed to pray, Christians, uh, Jews, and, and uh, any other religion is only allowed to visit. How do you see this shift in wording, trying to appease on the one hand, but at the uh, other hand also saying, okay, it's time for freedom of religion to also occur on uh, uh, areas that are holy for other religions as well. So again, several issues here. First, uh, just to respond to what uh, Fadi said. Uh, Fadi, um, you're <coughs> not surprised when American Jews rally in Manhattan for Israel, waving Israeli uh, flags and uh, supporting Israel's not only right to exist, but Israeli policies. But you don't expect them to immigrate to Israel. There's no the, war between Israel and the yes. United States. No, that's There's true, that's true. But, but they feel that they do not have uh, dual loyalty. They are citizens of one country, <laughs> but uh, in their hearts, they also uh, wish well another country. And, and Israeli Arabs, the so-called Arabs of 1948, have been um, integrated into Israel to such an extent that they prefer staying in Israel. Well, that's true. Uh, even though, of course, they, they want to see Palestinian uh, sovereignty and independence, but across the border. Well, it's not hard for them to understand. It's not the quite that simple. The, yeah. these, it's not quite that simple. The, 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 although very true that the vast majority of Israeli Arabs or Palestinian citizens of Israel are very are loyal <coughs> to Israel, they do not stand up for, Hatik, for the national anthem. They do not have um, Israeli and uh, let's say Palestinian flags in their mosque or institutions the way American Jews do. American Jews are very loyal to the United States as European Jews are to their homelands. That is not the situation in Israel um, in, in which Israeli Arabs are, are, are benefiting from being so in that, Israel, but I'd more like more to loyal move on actually so, no, no, to so the that, next question. That, tie, that ties to, to Jonathan's other question, um, the um, mixture of religion and nation state mm. aspirations because Jews are both a nation and a religion, uh, while Arabs could be Muslim or Christian. And as you asked about the Temple Mount, there was, of course, a proposal 70 odd years ago that the United Nations or, or the uh, uh, three great religions would have some joint uh, stewardship over the, uh, the uh, holy sites, even within Christendom. There are so many uh, churches vying uh, for, for uh, ownership 
um, or guardianship of various churches, it's it's very, very complicated. Well, the church, uh, of course, the, the various denominations of the old churches own a significant portion of Jerusalem today when we're talking about lands proper, including the Knesset, which is currently uh, being leased uh, by the Israeli government for the purpose of uh, holding its uh, uh, parliament. Uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to give us uh, somewhat of a, an assessment to where we're heading to. Mr. Dyker, we'll start with you. Uh, anybody who know, thinks that they know what will happen in the Middle East uh, is uh, is either a great gambler or a fool. So so I, I'm going to say that I, you, I think we do have the principles, the outline of a possible um, of a possible demilitarized Palestinian state. Remember, there's no other independence movement in the history of modern politics that was offered fifty billion dollars and full support by the West in order to, to develop. This could be the Hong Kong of the Middle East if the Palestinian bazaar, the middle class, the professional class of women and men who, who know what it is to work and build and develop an economy, if they stand up to the leadership and they say, enough game playing, you've turned it down every single time, our situation is much worse than it, it, that economically than it should be, let's negotiate with the Israelis. I think we're going through phases now, a little bit like grief. Uh, first of all, there was a shock phase. Uh, the Israelis are in favor, the Palestinians are against it, and the Arabs as well. As days pass by, the, the dynamics are changing. We hear more and more resistance from the Israeli different political uh, parties, not only the right wing, uh, people who live in the Negev and Khalutz are also rejecting that. Um, and on the other side, on the Arabs' uh, side, you hear voices, okay, let, let's look at the plan. I think what's gonna happen, people will have to absorb this, and it was very smart that they said, take four years to digest, for as long as I'm going to be president, this is, I mean, Mr. Trump knows that he's probably going to win in, in come November. And um, it's a very, very possibility. And um, we'll see what happens. But I think the dynamics speak here and not the, we're not in a state. Mr. Owen? The timing was, of course, um, tied to the elections in Israel in less than a month. And this is both a plus and a minus for the uh, plan because Netanyahu, of course, wants co-ownership over it. But his rivals want to wait until after the elections to have a look again to reconsider it. Can we see a, a annexation of uh, the territories in the near future before the election at least? No annexation without representation. Well, <laughs> this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Mr. Dyker, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Ismail for being with us. Having I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.